thanks for joining our first webinar as part of our 2023 webinar series. This webinar celebrates April being National Donate Life Month and the announcement of our 2023 CKF Award winners. My name is Anna morgan Pilardi. I am the Program Communications Director for the Chris Klug Foundation, and I will be introducing today's panelists and moderating today's session. I would like to first thank our generous sponsors, the Hearts for Us Foundation, who make this series possible. And thank you to all those who have submitted questions before today's session. If you have any uh, further questions for today's panelists, please send them to info at chrisklugfoundation.org. And if you're interested in any of the other topics we'll be discussing in this year's series, head to chrisklugfoundation.org slash CKF webinar series. Okay, now I'd like to introduce today's panelists. Uh, we have Bill Soloway. Bill is the tre president of TRIO, Transplant Recipients International Organization for the Philadelphia chapter. He received a life-saving heart transplant in June of 2015. Bill is actively involved in spreading the awareness message of the importance of organ donation. He is a volunteer with UNOS, Gift of Life Donor Program, and Help Hope Live, and is the recipient of the 2022 CKF Foundation's Bounce Back Give Back Award. Bill lives in Yardley, Pennsylvania, and enjoys riding his high wheel bike. Next up, we have Jen. Jen was 13 years old. She began complaining of abdominal pain before she collapsed at a lacrosse game. Je she was taken to the hospital where they performed an exploratory surgery. During this surgery, Jen went into cardiac arrest. The doctors diagnosed her with cardiomyopathy, which led to her remaining in hospital from April to July before she received her life-saving transplant. Jen has gone on to volunteer with the American Heart Association, Hearts for Us, Live on New York, and many more. Jen lives every day as if it's her birthday and is always and is also the recipient of our 2022 Bounce Back Give Back Award. Finally, we have Tracy Copeland. Tracy is the founder and president of Sierra Nevada Donut Awareness, a nonprofit that raises awareness of the importance of organ donors nationwide. Tracy was in perfect health when she went into acute liver failure. After a month of testing to determine the problem, she became comatose and required a transplant within hours to survive. A match was found, and Tracy has gone on to compete in the U.S. and World Transplant Games, as well as triathlons, marathons, and the Arizona Ironman, alongside creating her own nonprofit. Tracy was the 2020 Bounce Back Give Back Award winner. Thank you all for joining us today. Now I'd like to start with some questions. We'd like to keep these discussions informal, so please feel free to join in each other's answers. Bill, I'm going to start with you. Can you talk about your transplant journey and the feelings and emotions you experienced during the process and before you got the call to get your transplant? Sure, Anna. So my journey was a 20-year journey to my heart transplant. And certainly everybody's journey is different. And I know of some people who had had years waiting, um, several months days. And I just heard recently, uh, I had a guest on who had COVID and ended up in the hospital. And then she got a double lung because she was on ECMO. So she didn't even know she got a transplant until she woke up. So again, everybody's journey is different. But, you know, for me, I was uh, had an episode uh, back in 96, where I collapsed in an airport and then I was diagnosed with a genetic heart defect that my brother had died of at the age of 27. So that was the start of my journey. I got a defibrillator implant. I was on medications and pretty much lived a relatively normal lifestyle. I am an avid bicyclist, so I was still able to continue to ride my bike and uh, do things until things got progressively worse. So you know, five years or so into it, I was doing a hundred mile bike ride and I started experiencing some abnormal heart arrhythmias, some AFib, and then things changed from there. I got put on different medications. I had cardioversion procedures to get me out of AFib back in a normal sinus rhythm. Uh, and then, you know, things were going okay. I was still able to do my biking and so forth. And then I went into congestive heart failure and things kind of came to a screeching halt, right? I could no longer ride my bike. Uh, walking five steps was like climbing Mount Everest for me. Uh, to walk up steps was just uh, terrible. 
And, you know, my mom ended up dying from congestive heart failure. So uh, it was just really an emotional thing at that point. And uh, I knew that transplant was imminent at this point. And then two years, you know, after congestive heart failure uh, was my transplant. So it was, you know, a lengthy journey. Uh, with a lot of trials and tribulations. I never really thought I would live to 50 years old, quite frankly. And uh, I ended up being the primary caregiver of my 86-year-old father. And um, I didn't think I was even going to outlive him, right? And obviously, um, you know, that really affected me because after watching my dad lose his oldest son, my brother, uh, to heart disease, and then my mother to heart disease, and then here I'm next up. Um, you know, that's a tough thing for a family to have to go through, right? So uh, thankfully, I got, I got the gift of life through a heart transplant. I was able to outlive my 86-year-old father. I was able to celebrate my 50th birthday. And more importantly, for me, especially, was getting back on my bike and uh, being able to ride 100 mile bike rides. So, you know, it's certainly a roller coaster of emotions. And, you know, I always said that Tom Petty says it best in his song, right? The waiting is the hardest part. So, people that are on the list, uh, we just don't know when we're going to get that gift, right? And certainly, 20 people die every day waiting for this life saving gift. So, I didn't want to be that statistic by any means. And, uh, you know, it, it's just such an emotional roller coaster, but you just have to be positive. You just have to stay the course, right? And I know Jen and Tracy can echo the same. Awesome. Yeah, that's so true. The I couldn't imagine waiting that long. Do you have any advice for someone that might be on the wait list currently, you know, sort of to help them through that process? Well, listen, I've had a good friend uh, have to wait 667 days, right, for a life-saving heart transplant. And, you know, when we're talking, uh, as far as the panelists today, uh, kidney or, excuse me, two hearts and a liver, right, we get our organs a lot quicker than if you're on the kidney waiting list. Because depending on what part of the country you live in, it could be anywhere from four to seven years uh, to get your life-saving gift. So, you, you know, the best advice I can give is that it's just a season, right? And this is not a sprint, it's a marathon. So you really need to pace yourself and have a support network in place and just know that uh, every day is one day closer to getting your life-saving transplant. Yeah, the support network is definitely key, definitely. Okay, Tracy, uh, the immediate post-transplant recovery can be tough and is very different for each individual, as uh, Bill just pointed out. Can you talk to your experience during uh, your recovery? Was there anything in particular that helped you during your recovery that might help other people? Sure. Well, thank you for having me, and thanks, Bill. Um, you're right. Every journey is so unique and so different, and uh, people are waiting. I would, as as Bill has also encouraged, I would encourage you to stay positive, right? Surround yourself with those positive, encouraging support group. Try and stay active as much as you can to keep yourself healthy so that when you do receive your transplant, that your recovery is that much easier. So for me, um, my liver died suddenly, as, as Anna pointed out, very suddenly. And so I was healthy one day, getting ready to go on a ski trip, uh, going to the gym, and then I found myself very ill. And uh, over the course of um, just about a month when I realized I was sick to when I was taken or flew down to Stanford University and uh, found myself the following Monday in a coma waiting for a life-saving transplant. So my journey really started after my transplant because I had no idea that I was even on the list until I woke up with that life-saving transplant. So it is tough. And, and I always say, uh, I always tell new recipients that first year, you know, you'll get you'll get your your cocktail. We call it the cocktail, right? The medications that you're going to take. You're going to have a real roller coaster ride with those because 
every individual is different. And so your doctors are really trying to find that unique combination that's just for you. So they're going to be one day, you know, reducing this and increasing that and telling you you need magnesium or, you know, you need this or you need that. And so, um, you know, I would just encourage you to, to, to know that that's going to change and that's going to level out and those um, side effects that you're having from those meds and th that kind of roller coaster of this med, that med, and the 120 pills you're starting with, that's going to, that's going to calm down and that's going to, going to come to an end and you're going to find that right cocktail with your, with the help of your transplant team. But physically or, or also, you know, um, for every, again, every recovery is going to be different depending on, how sick you were when you received your transplant. But uh, I asked my doctors, what should I do for recovery? And what, what PT do you have for me? And they said, walk. So that's my most encouraging or my biggest piece of advice to a newly transplanted person is try and walk. Drink lots of water. Get as much water down as you can and try and get out there and walk. And it might be a walk from here to the mailbox today. And then maybe tomorrow it's down the block a little bit, or then it's you're working into your first mile. And and then when you feel good, walk those stairs, you know. But uh, just really, again, in that, especially in that first year, that first period, you can, you know, really just encourage yourself to be as active as your body will allow you to. But walking, there's no... No better exercise than walking. Sw swimming is, is really good, but, you know, again, until you're prepared and ready for that and cleared by your doctors for that kind of activity, you know, walking is something you can just really continue to, to, um, to do and to be healthy, and it will make you feel better. Um, so, yeah, I think that's probably my, uh, my biggest piece of advice for a newly transplanted individual. So I agree with Tracy, right? That first year after transplant is critical and important because, you know, I liken it to a new car. When you get a new car, you're not supposed to drive it um, at high speeds until after a couple of weeks. And that's pretty much the same thing when you get a transplanted organ. Now, obviously, every organ is different. Um, and, you know, I relate my heart to like an engine of a car. Um, my engine was firing on one cylinder. And when they took out that old engine and dropped in a new engine, it was like I had a V8 and I was firing on eight cylinders. And it took almost a year for my body to get used to um, my new heart because my body was so used to an inefficient heart that it just wanted to lay around. And my heart was saying, hey, we want to get up and we want to do stuff. And the body's going like, yeah, right. And, uh, you know, it took some time for my heart to get used to my body and my body to get used to the new heart. Not to mention all the medications. So again, depending on what organ you get is a different medicine regimen. And from my experience, I was really ramped up on prednisone, right? And one of the biggest things with prednisone is roid rage. When you're on a high dose of prednisone, um, you do get uh, roid rage or steroid rage, right? And your personality changes. And this is one of the things that I tell the caregivers, especially, you know, if your loved one all of a sudden seems like they've been abducted by an alien and it's not their personality, it's the medication talking. It's not them. So you need to be sensitive to that because in my situation, I was on over a hundred different medications, right? And what I mean by that is some medications I'd have to take three or four pills, right? So, and I had to do this four times a day. Well, listen, I'm almost eight years out now and I'm on two immunosuppressant meds that I take twice a day. Nowhere near what we were taking initially, right, Jen? I mean, we had a lot of medications. <laughs> I'm in a very different spot than you, but that's amazing that you're only taking the two because that's phenomenal in itself. That's a gift. Well, again, everybody's journey is different, right? So, and Tracy, how about you? I mean, when you were first transplanted, you were on a lot of medications. You're nowhere on near what you were on then, right? Yeah, no, I know I was on prednisone as well. 
And uh, gosh, it was just uh, it's coming from somebody who didn't take you know, aspirin or, you know, Tylenol, really. Uh, it was overwhelming, you know, to try and keep track. But um, so I am also in the quarter century tra- uh, club. I just passed my 25 year transplant anniversary in March. So all I take now is thank you, as prograph, as um, uh, macrolimus, they call it, or the generic for prograph. So, and that's all I take uh, one and a half milligrams, milligram in the morning and a half at night. So, uh, there, there's light at the end of that tunnel, right? And, and again, I think to Jen's point, sometimes depending on your, your illness, you know, a, a lot of that is going to um, dictate what what your continued medical regimen will be. But uh, just post transplant, it's a little it's a little nuts um, that first year trying to get all of that straightened out. But yeah, yeah, we definitely hear a lot of people say, um, you know, I listened to Chris's story and I got inspired and I went to the gym and I decided I was going to lift these weights. And I remember one person telling me. Well, I ripped open all of my stitches immediately. <laughs> and he said, I learned I wasn't Chris Kluge, but I did my own transplant journey. And last year he did the New York marathon and he finished it. And, you know, everybody's journey, I like to think of it like the Olympics. Everybody competes their own Olympics, whether that, as you, Tracy said, is walking to the mailbox or whether that's winning a bronze medal at the Olympics. It's your Olympic story. And it's, you know, your post transplant recovery and everything's different okay i'm going to throw it to uh jen real quick jen your transplant journey was a little different to everybody here you were a teenager when you had a transplant um how do you feel that this altered your post-transplant journey and how do you feel that families and caregivers can support a teenage transplant recipients that may be slightly different to an adult having a transplant i was a healthy teenager as the recipients were saying before, a lot of times our lives get changed very quickly, but I was a healthy teenage girl at 13. My problems were what I was going to wear to school, boys. I, I played every sport you could think of, but I wasn't very good at them, but I was an avid baton twirler. And those were really, though, my biggest problems in life. My younger brother was born with a hole in his heart, but he was okay, luckily, after his surgery and everything went well. So I was his healthy older sister. I never even broke a bone up until 13. I only had my tonsils out. So pretty much regular, typical teenager things that people are doing. And I started then after my 13th birthday, March 4th of 96, having really severe stomach pains. And it was very hard for my family and myself because I was going to different doctors different hospitals, and they kept telling my family pretty much that I was becoming a woman about a month and a half until I ended up back in an emergency room. And they told my parents, worst case scenario could have been that my ovaries were twisted, which would have been hard to hear as a woman because I couldn't have children when I grew up. But they went in to do something called exploratory surgery in my abdominal region because that's where I was presenting with pain. And during the surgery, I went into cardiac arrest. They actually sent my parents home because I come from a very small family and they wanted to go be with my brother. And they called them two hours later and said, your daughter's dying of heart failure. You need to come say goodbye now. So I actually had my last rites read to me at 13. And I was, they pretty much said that your daughter is not going to make it. And for me, I was very lucky because there was one doctor on call that was affiliated with a hospital in the city where I was in Long Island. And all I remember when I got there, now I was 13, I woke up and these doctors said, you need a heart transplant. I thought it was like my brother, open heart surgery. I'm like, okay, yeah, sign me up. Let's go do this. Not realizing exactly what went into it. And at that point, I'm from Hicksville. I was the first one in the district to ever need a transplant. So it was very rough because when I got there, I got my Broviac tube. They try to make your hospital stay as normal as they can. They have something called Child Life, which was my savior. You go and you make different arts and crafts. They have a school where when you felt good, you could go there. But I couldn't walk from here five feet because I had cardiomyopathy where you get a virus and it destroys your heart and they'll never know exactly or pinpoint how that happens, but that's what happened to me. And I just remember that the days were turning into weeks, weeks turned into months. And again, as I said, my family, my friends, they tried to make your hospital stay as normal as possible, but you are a teenager. I actually have a picture. This was my hospital room 
when I was 13. And as you could see, it was decorated. I had my shades on. I thought I was a cool teenager. Then again, in this situation where I knew someone was going to have to pass away for me to live, but I'm grateful in a way that I was so young that I don't think I fully understood the circumstances at the time. And for me, my life-saving transplant came on July 6, 96 from a 13-year-old boy named Matthew. And this is my donor in the middle. I waited three months and a day in the hospital. And after that journey, I really wasn't sure what was going to happen. They told my parents, by my 18th birthday, I might not make it. By my 25th birthday, I might not make it. My 30th, I just turned 40 this year. And it's really, it's been a journey. And as a teenager going through the process, one thing I love to tell, especially when I speak now to kids in school, is that to try to treat people that even if you have something different about you, it's okay, and that we all have things that come up. But being a recipient at such a young age and being on all this medicine, now I was on prednisone, all these drugs, well going through my hormonal changes and everything. I either wanted to hug you, I might hit you. We really didn't know at that moment in my life. And I'm so fortunate that I had my family and really having that support system around, but I honestly don't remember what it's like to not have my transplant. And a lot of times when I meet people that are younger that are having transplants, a lot of times now that I'm older, I speak to their family because it's very hard as a teenager. There's not, there's support, but there, it's very hard to tell a 13 year old what to do in general. And now you're telling them you have to take all this medication. A lot of things happen. I lost my hair, just never grow back. So I wear wigs now, or I have my scar. And there's things that come along, even just forget the transplant aspect of it. As I was saying, I still take a lot of pills. I take more than 20 a day. But being a heart recipient, I call it way back when ages, when they were giving us donkey pills, which I'm sure Tracy might understand, like when we were taking cyclosporin and we all look like this and people just wanted to pinch my cheeks. And I was like, why are you strangers touching me? You no one's supposed to touch me, they said, because I'm immune suppressed. But <laughs> it's, it's very different, I think, being so young and having the transplant. But the only thing I would tell a teenager is that there is honestly light at the end of the other side. And it really is a roller coaster. And if you like roller coaster, there's gonna be ups and downs and in-betweens. But if you can make it through that teenage year in general and then get out on the other side, you could keep going. And also that sometimes they could give you all the statistics in the world. As all of us know, there's a lot of statistics, but that doesn't mean, I always tell doctors to look at us, not just as a diagnosis, but as patients, because I have friends of mine that have sadly had transplants only five years and need second ones. There's people now that have had their hearts 35 years. Sometimes there's no exact rhyme or reason, but it's really just about living your life. And I really live my life like it's my birthday every day because that's what I know how to do do. Even now, sometimes I talk to, I just switch hospitals and doctors say, are you sure you have your, oh, you know, things come up, you go get testing. I mean, I'm lucky enough that I just turned 40 and now I get to do 40 year old stuff like mammograms. I know it sounds silly, but I never thought I'd be doing typical normal things that 40 year olds have to do. So, I mean, I'm a big child, just go to Disney a lot. But to me, that's that's my happy place and that's what I try to do. So it's really just as a teenager to them, remember to take your drugs and that's why your family's so important because they say in that time frame, that's the biggest time of rejection is when you're under 18. Because if you're left to your own regards, it's very sad, but think about being a teenager in general and people telling you what to do. And now you got to take 30 pills on top of that and you have a face that looks like a moon. It's really not the best sometimes. So really just having your family and friends and letting others know that it's okay to be different and you can get out on the other side and just live your life. It's so inspiring. <laughs> I struggled in my teenagers, period. I couldn't have imagined having a transplant and going through being a teenager. Um, and plus, every time I see your Disney <laughs> photos, it makes me exceptionally jealous. <laughs> I know. I, I, yeah. okay. I just love it. Yeah. <laughs> It's such a good place. I just took my niece. I was in heaven. I ran around like a giant big kid. <laughs> okay, Tracy, uh, you are an avid athlete and have, have you always been athletic? Um, what role did your transplant play in uh, your athleticism and athletic goals? Did it, you know, put a new lease of life into you? Can you talk to that for a moment? Sure. So I am the seventh of eight children. 
So uh, my oldest brother, Mark, is a little less than eight years older than I am. So my, my mother had seven children in less than eight years. So I say that to say when you're the seventh of eight children and five of your older siblings are boys, you are either strong or you're fast. So I was running and jumping and swimming pretty young. So, but as far as being an athlete, I never considered myself an athlete. I mean, I love to, you know, kind of get out there and run and ride my bike. And well, all of us kids were in swim lessons when, when we were young, because that was the only time that mom got a free moment was when we were all at swim lessons together. So, um, so yeah, I was pretty active. Um, just before my transplant, we were planning on going on a ski trip and I was going to the gym, but really, you know, I was just trying to keep in shape, right? Trying to keep active and in shape. So my athletic pursuits really all came after my transplant. So I never considered myself an athlete um, until after I received my transplant. So I had the um, very unique blessing to meet my donor family on the one year anniversary of my transplant. So I'm wearing my pin, which you probably can't see, but um, my donor, Terry Lee Snow, died in a motorcycle accident at 19 years old uh, in Arizona. And his family was in Southern California. We lived in Reno, Nevada. So they came to Reno to meet to meet us on the one year anniversary of Terry's death in my life. Well, we developed a very close um, life bonding relationship and I consider the Snows my family. So I'm giving you the long story, right? That's what we like. <laughs> but, <laughs> so my donor's mom, Kathy, was a nurse at the time of Terry's death and she became a renal transplant coordinator. So as I was saying, we would get together, we still get together every year, but uh, John and Kathy had gone to uh, Utah to a, um, uh, a kidney symposium. So on their way back from Utah, they stopped at our house and they spent the night and it was, uh, I think, 20, two, uh, 2002. And Kathy came in and said, hey, there's this thing called the transplant games. And uh, they're going to be in Disney World. <laughs> and um, we were just wondering if you maybe wanted to go and compete and we'll go with you and support you. And I was like, yeah, let's bring it on. So that was kind of the first, uh, my first adventure. And I was, uh, my husband and I were avid cyclists. So that very first transplant games, I participated solely in the biking. So um, I was blessed in uh, training with a lot of, men at the time so i uh, left there with two uh with two gold medals in cycling and was just thrilled but it kind of um it, it spoke to me in a way that i could realize that i could really um impact our community raising awareness for this tremendous need for organ and tissue donation by showing the success of organ donation so i uh, continued with the transplant games uh, with my donor family. So they have attended, I've, attend, I've participated in five U.S. games and um, three world games and um, uh, just really started to started to add in running. And then, well, first, the second, the second time I decided, well, maybe I could swim. And then I added in running. And then I had a friend here in, in uh, Nevada that said, hey, I'm doing a triathlon. And so uh, I went and did my first triathlon, I think it was 2008, maybe. And uh, my husband, when he realized that they were competitive, he was like all over it because he's very competitive. He goes, you need to do that. And so uh, that opened up some more doors for me, and I was able to compete in the Arizona Ironman in um, 2013 with my donor family. So, and again, Arizona is where Terry passed away. So it was very meaningful that my donor family came and supported me as I finished that Ironman. And so uh, really, you know, I think it kind of just speaks again to your journey and what you can do, you know, having a transplant um, is life-saving and life-enhancing and will change your life. But it, it, it doesn't mean that those things that you loved went before, you're not going to be able to do and then even more so so really i i didn't become an athlete until 
after my transplant. And um, I'm just very blessed to be able to continue. I haven't done a whole lot of triathlons in the last couple of years, but I'm headed to Washington, D.C. in October to do the Marine Corps Marathon. So I've never been to D.C., so I'm super excited about that. And we've started our training journey for that. So it'll be it'll be fun. Exciting. That's amazing. Good luck. <laughs> But, you know, yeah. getting back to the whole part about being athletic and after transplant, we get transplants so we can get our life back and be able to do the things that we weren't able to do while we were waiting for our transplant. You know, as Jen pointed out, we're living our best life one day and then the next day things come to a screeching halt, right? And a lot of us don't think we're ever going to get back to that level of activity. And then here we are after transplant, we're back to that level and for some and then some, right? So... You know, for me, I was involved in the transplant games as well. In fact, that was my motivation after my heart transplant is to get back on the bike and to compete in the games. So to have some kind of goal in mind, and it doesn't have to be huge like that. It could be like getting in shape to do a 2K donor walk or something, um, you know, but the, the important thing is to have some kind of physical activity after transplant and not just lay around on the couch watching TV or um, feeling sorry for yourself. It's about getting your life back and reclaiming your life and being able to do some physical activity. And the games, as you were saying, I think the wonderful thing with the games is I honestly, I didn't go to the games until about 12 years ago. So my first games were in Texas. I, I missed the Disney ones. I didn't want to go to the games because I was so scared being a transplant patient with not many people around. I'm like, you're going to send me to a place with a bunch of me? I was like, I'm crazy right now. I didn't know what if I was up or down or going through my years. I'm like, I'm going to go with more of me. Not going to happen. And when I went there for the first time, the wonderful thing is, as Bill was saying, it's getting out there. It doesn't matter what you do. There is a walk that you could do. There's darts. There's cornhole. They just added trivia and different things. So if you ever thought about going to the games, you could ask any of us. It doesn't. You don't have to just be an athlete. And to me, if you get out there and do something, you're an athlete. But it's about finding something that makes you happy and being surrounded by such this camaraderie of recipients and donor families and caregivers. And we're all there for our common goals. I mean, I went there with a green tennis racket and someone's like, oh, you like to play tennis? I'm like, I got a green one and I hope I won a medal. And I won because it was in Texas and people knocked out because of the heat. So that was cool. I got to wear a medal and be like everybody else. And I just hope that I win in my age category so I'm good like everybody else. But it really is, as you said, the small goals in life. The best compliment I ever got was somebody from Facebook because I could win a medal on Facebook, friends. They said to me, they didn't care what I did or what I do, but they see the pictures. And I just post everything because I had a house fire years ago, so that's my own thing. I like to have everything on Facebook and pictures because memories you'll always have. And they're like, the memories and the things you do, that – Want, that wants me to keep moving forward with my transplant and do things. And all it is is me posting everyday pictures. I mean, I go to Walmart and that's an adventure. So really that's what transplant can do. Just giving you your, your life back. Even, like I said, the monotony of the everyday. Most people don't want to get mammograms, but I was excited for mine. You know, we talk about the games and it's not about a lot of physical activity. There are darts, there's ballroom dancing, there's cornhole. So there's something for just about everyone, right? Blackjack. So uh, you don't have to think that you have to run a marathon or uh, be a great swimmer or biker or run track and field. There's something for everyone, really. No, that's so true. I'll just share a little story from the from the games in uh, the in Pittsburgh, so we were swimming and you know people were cheering and cheering. But there was a there was a gal who um, had, had a kidney transplant and she was she was blind and she was she had somebody on the side of the pool that was encouraging her along, telling her where she was at. And so everybody was done and we were all waiting and watching her and. The biggest eruption from the crowd was not when the gold medalist 
cross, you know, touched the wall. It was when this beautiful young lady hit the wall for, you know, at the end of her 400, that was just the entire place erupted. You know, it was tears and that was her journey. And, and yeah, it's not really about winning the medals and there's so much more you can do. It's about doing the best and being the best that you can be right where you're at, you know, today. I love that. That's the perfect way to phrase it. And the Transplant Games is, yeah, I did it my first one in San Diego and just there with the CKF booth. And it's so positive. And I keep saying, Jesse, my coworker, I'm like, you wait, you've experienced nothing until you get to go to the Transplant Games. I'm like, everything we do is cool, but that is on a whole new level. <laughs> but awesome. So Bill, I'm going to pass it back to you. Uh, you've ha- worked really hard to support those going through transplant. Why do you feel that it's essential for transplant recipients to give back to the community and be inspirations for others going through the process? Yeah, and a good question. And I always like to say that one of the hardest things for most transplant recipients is to know that someone had to die in order to save their life. And that's a big thing to get your head wrapped around, right? And some people really struggle with that. And one of the things that really helped me is to certainly pray for my donor and my donor's family when I was being listed, right? We don't even know who they are going to be, when that's all going to happen. But that kind of gave me uh, some peace of mind. And then after receiving that gift, just trying to figure out a way to honor my donor, do something in memory of them that a part of them is living on, right, in me. And I'm not just living my best life now, I'm living the life of my donor as well, right? And what I found is helping people through the journey, it was a great way to honor my donor. And, you know, when I was going through this, I aligned myself with someone who was a year out and, you know, we talked about some of the difficulties of transplant. And, you know, one of my neat stories was the fact that um, I, after transplant was in the shower and all of a sudden my hands locked up, you know, I was just like this and it was real excruciating pain and I'm trying to peel my fingers back and I I was freaking out. I'm like, what is happening? You know, my hair's all shampooed up and I couldn't even uh, get the shampoo out of my hair. And of course, after I got out of the shower and everything, I called my friend and I said, Hey, what is the deal with this? Have this, has this ever happened to you? And he started laughing at me. Right. And he goes, "Um, you need to take more magnesium, but you need to contact your team, let them know what's happening. But if you have more magnesium on board, that'll go away. Right. So here I was first freaking out and then he's laughing at me. And then of course I chewed a couple magnesium and it went away. And of course I let the team know, but it it was that kind of thing that I realized that it's really important to, to, reach back and help people through the journey, right? It's their journey, but you can be on the sideline and you can help them. Um, You know, we keep saying everybody's journey is different. Everybody's not going to experience the same things that we experience. Uh, So I learned that early on to not really reveal too much, but if they came to me and said, hey, did this ever happen to you? Then I would share some things, right? Um, But Really, I found being a mentor to people and helping them through the process, both pre and post transplant was very therapeutic for me. Um, And again, uh, I I do it in honor of my donor. And I think that really took the edge off to, to go, hey, you know, my donor lives on in me and I'm able to give back. And um, you know, I would encourage other people to, to get plugged in and involved. I know some people want to know who their donor is. I know people that don't know who their donor is and they go about living their lives, but it it just really helped me from a mental standpoint to know I was giving back and doing something uh, to honor our donors. And, you know, when I was in the transplant games, my first medal went to my donor's family, right? Um, And I'm constantly trying to figure out the next thing that I'm going to do to say it's thanks to my donor that I'm doing this, right? And let people know 
how important that really is. Amazing. And if anybody is interested in getting involved, we do have our patient ambassador program, which is the perfect opportunity to help others. Um, all three of our panelists today are ambassadors for us. And you simply come on and share your story or head into a school and share your story with students, um, possibly a hospital. Um, we do all kinds of fun things. There's something for everybody. So if you are interested, just simply reach out. Um, and now I'm going to throw it back to Jen for our last question of this session. How can an individual become involved in the transplant community post-transplant? What suggestions do you have um, for recipients to find nearby opportunities to them? I was personally thrown into it when I was 13. I had my heart transplant and around the time Frank Torrey's had his transplant. So pretty much Joe Torrey and Frank Torrey, if you're a Yankee fan, they wanted a child that had a transplant that they could speak and share their journey. And it was great because my brother's younger than me, but he loved the Yankees. So I was sort of thrown into the American Heart Association and got my first speaking engagement at 13 when back then I didn't want to speak and now they can't stop me from speaking. But really, I think nowadays, honestly, with there's so much with Facebook and Instagram and different media platforms that you could really join so many groups on those type of ways. Also, your hospital, depending upon where you're at, is a great support system. I've actually been, I know Bill's president of the trio, Philadelphia. I'm part of Long Island Trio since I'm 13. They grew up with me. Pretty much they went through my whole life. So it's wonderful when they see me. It's so cute, even though I'm 40 now. They're still like, oh, our little girl. And I'm like, okay, that's cute though. I love it. But they really got to grow up with me. So I'd say really maybe start with your hospital, start talking to different people that you know that had transplants or nowadays with that. Even look on Facebook, Instagram, different platforms. Even honestly, just writing in Google saying, support groups in my area or ways to help out. Chris Klug, I found them through another friend of mine. That's how the foundation kind of started. And even with Hearts for Us, I'm very involved with them and they knew you guys. So we all had that connection. So it's really just about looking around and it's out there. And if you find one person, like Bill said, one friend can really change your whole world and more doors can open. So just know that you're not alone and there is opportunity in many different places. And it doesn't have to be a traditional way. Maybe you're not in a school or different place, but just sharing your journey or just living your life really is a way of connecting with others. Yeah, and I just want to add to that what Jen just said. You know, a good place to start is right at your own OPO or organ procurement organization. Um, they're the agency that actually procures your organ for you. And in Philadelphia, it's the Gift of Life uh, donor program. And uh, they have ambassador training. Uh, they basically prepare you to uh, first understand the process, right? What you just went through and then be able to set you up with different speaking engagements, even do some speaking training if you need help with that and uh, send you on your way and obviously be an anchor and a support for you to get resources, materials that you can hand out. And, you know, then the possibilities are limitless, right? You can get involved in the Chris Klug Foundation. You can get involved with uh, TRIO, the different chapters across the country. Of course, Hearts for Russ Foundation. There's a lot of different um, groups out there that are even organ specific, right? So it, it all depends on what your needs are, but there's certainly something for everyone out there. You just have to look and ask a lot of questions, right? And Tracy has her own organization too, and they do great work as well. So there's another option for you. Um, and just a quick one, transplant games. So if someone has heard our conversation today and really wants to get involved in transplant games, how do they find their local team? How do they get involved in that? So there's a website, Transplant Games of America. If you log onto that site, you're going to see all kinds of neat stuff from the San Diego games. Uh, they just announced that the games are going to be held in Birmingham, Alabama next year. Uh, so uh, that's when the next games are. They are held every two years, and the opposing year are the World Games. So this year, uh, right now as we talk, uh, the World Games are happening in Perth, Australia. Go Team USA! We're winning medals <laughs> over there. <laughs> um but uh, and reach out to your OPO, right, because your organ procurement organization is typically the one that puts together the team for your area. 
and uh, they'll start having meetings uh, preparing for that. So uh, they're the best two resources, Transplant Games of America and Europio to get on your local team for the games. Thank you all for sharing your experiences and joining us today on the webinar. Um, now, as previous Bounce Back winners, we wanted you to announce our 2023 CKF Award winners. So I'm going to hand it over to Tracy for the winner of our Hero Award. So it's a, it's a pleasure and an honor to be able to announce the 2023 uh, CKF Award Bounce Back Award winners. And I am pleased to announce the 2023 Hero Award winner is Katrina Fountain, a donor mother whose five-week-year-old son, Jaleel, went on to save two lives through organ donation. Katrina has become a volunteer and an advocate for organ donation. Hey, and up next is the winner of the 2023 Bounce Back Give Back Award, Dave Goblenski, who received a liver transplant from a living donor. Dave has gone on to advocate for organ donation, running donor awareness nights with professional baseball fields and Major League Baseball. And finally, the winner of the 2023 Community Champion Award is Maria Fernanda Filizola, who is both a caregiver and employed employee of Donate Life Northwest. Maria cared for her ex-husband as he received a kidney transplant and is currently caring for their daughter as she faced the probability of also needing a manager for Donate Life Northwest focusing on expanding programming in undeserved communities. Woohoo to everybody for these wonderful awards. Yeah, congratulations, everyone. So thank you for tuning into today's session. A huge congratulations to our 2023 CKF award winners. We will be reaching out and you will be joining us for our 2023 Wine and Dine in July in Snowmass. Um, if you have any questions for today's panel or want to learn more about this year's webinar series, head to chriskluefoundation.org slash CKF webinar series. We hope you have a great rest of your day. Stay safe, stay healthy. Happy Donate Life Month, everyone, and continue to live life, give life. <laughs>